We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall, and welcome to The Meaningful Life. My witness today believes aging is the best thing that ever happened to her. She is the author and lecturer Kathleen O'Brien. Kathleen taught at the University of Denver's Continuing Education Program and has a new book out with the inspiring title, Reclaim Your Right to Be Old, How to Immerse Yourself in, Be Curious About, and Celebrate Life's Most Important Stage. I was brought up with the idea that you should never ask a woman her age. When we were children, my parents refused to tell my sister and I how old they were in case we blabbed their ages all around town. So why do you think we've got this sort of reticence about ages, Kathleen? Oh, Andrew, I think it's because of the stereotype that being old is something we want to avoid. And this is kind of unique to Western culture. Not totally, but in many cultures around the world and certainly in ancient civilizations, you see a real almost reverence for older people, for their experience, perspective, and wisdom, and what they bring to the culture. In our society, in Western society, I think we tend to be more about productivity, and and we measure value of human beings in a different way. So we don't necessarily value what older people bring to the table And I think your parents wanted to stay young because they thought it made them more viable in the culture. And to admit your age is to say, well, I don't have much to contribute, which is exactly what I would argue against. Well, this program is all about busting things that we don't talk about. So I'm going to ask that question that I've, I don't think I've ever asked a woman since I was like 14 years old which is, how old are you, Kathleen? Well, I am 73, almost 73 and a half. So I kind of feel like when a little 10-year-old is asked, how old are you? He always says, well, I'm 10 and three months, or I'm 10 and a half, or I'm almost 11. Well, I feel that way about aging too. I don't want to portray myself as less mature, Andrew, than I am. So I am 73 and a half. I really value that half. Now, what sort of reaction do you get from people when you tell them you're 73? Well, a lot of (laughs) a lot of people don't believe it. I I I am fortunate to have pretty good genes and people think I don't look my age, but I think, you know, therein lies the problem. We have an idea of what 73 looks like, quote unquote. And it is based on stereotypes. It's interesting because there is a gerontologist who is well known at the University of California, San Francisco. Her name's Louise Aronson. And when she talks about her patients, she says, when you've seen one 80 year old, you've seen one 80 year old. As we age, we differentiate ourselves more from one another. In other words, five-year-olds are very much alike in so many ways. 80-year-olds are quite different. Aging doesn't just depend on genetics, although that helps. It depends in part on lifestyle, but that isn't all. It also depends on whether or not we've had accidents, bad luck, Certainly, socioeconomic factors weigh mightily into how we look as we age. Also, Andrew, how we look is not the whole story. There are plenty of people who may look, quote unquote, old for their years who live way up into their 90s. So there's really no guarantee. I think we need new role models people who show us what it is to be, for instance, 73 and a half. And there are a variety of looks that go with that and a variety of, you know, levels of healthiness that also go with that. 
So I'm going to tell you my age as well. Actually, I often uh, say it. I'm 62. And I have to say, you know, I thought passing 60 was getting old. When do you think it actually happens? What age? Oh. When, when did you first start feeling or believing or being interested in the concept of old? Well, I certainly, when I was about your age, Andrew, in fact, it was a little before then. It was, you know, about 13 years ago as I approached 60. I started thinking about, about it in part, I think, because of the way our society views older people and in particular older women. The idea that, well, you know, you've got to look young, feel young, be young. You've got to be out there. You've got to be getting a facelift and a tummy tuck. And you've got to be doing all these things to make you look young. And I thought, I don't want to do that. That's crazy. Aging is all about either defying it or denying it, isn't it? And you don't have to do that. You can actually just embrace it. Yes, I often say it's not about denying it, but immersing yourself in the aging process. The aging process is natural. There is nothing wrong with it. It is only our society's take on it that makes it seem as if, you know, things have gone awry. And this is the time in our lives when we really begin to learn about ourselves. Who am I? What is life about? It's only when we're really old that we can answer these questions. So I think when you start thinking about these questions, you are beginning to enter your later years. And I thought about that as I approached 60. And even more now, I'm very aware of the world around me, of my place in the world, about what is important to me. These are necessary parts of being human. And if we don't allow ourselves to age, if we are constantly chasing after our younger selves, we're not going to experience all that old age offers us. Because one of the central questions we often ask on this podcast is, who am I? And you've answered that question, have you? And if so, I'd, I'd love to hear your answer because it's something I'm still working on. So possibly it's something, the answer is something I've got to look forward to when I reach my 70s. So help me. How do you answer the question, who am I? I don't know that I've totally answered it. I think I have narrowed it down. I think, who am I? Who am I? I'm a person who feels deeply about things, who is compassionate almost to a fault. I've tried to deny that and tried to be like other people <laughs> when I was younger. Oh, I don't care about that. But I do. And I'm also a person who has a lot of anxiety. Oh. And I've been that way my whole life. I worry about things less now that I'm older because I can see a bigger picture. But what I have learned about myself is that I'm not done. I'm not done growing. And there is more to find out about who I am. I think this is one of the great journeys that human beings make. Uh, other sentient beings, as far as we know, don't have the ability to reflect and say, who am I? What is this all about? What is life offering me? And what should I do with it? Human beings can do this, and why deny yourself a most marvelous human experience? And you dedicate your book to your mother-in-law <laughs> and say that she taught you so much about aging. So tell me about your mother-in-law. What kind of woman was she, and what did she teach you about aging? Oh, if she could hear you ask that question, she would be laughing in the background. <laughs> She was a person who just enjoyed the moments as they unfolded. Not that she didn't worry occasionally about things she did, but she accepted life as it was. She had this wonderful way of just embracing everything that happened to her, whether they were good things or not so good things. And she was always up for a good time. 
And she had a way of just letting herself go, which as a person, me, who has sort of this chronic anxiety all the time kind of hovering around me, that is hard sometimes for me. And what I have learned from her is the more you let go in a way, the more you gain control over your life. I mean, when you let go, you know, you you can control the situation better because you're not so hung up on what you're worried about. So what a wonderful person. (laughs) I was so lucky to have her as a mother-in-law. The more you let go, the more control you have. Let's put that specifically into the subject of aging. The more you let go and allow yourself to become this older person you were meant to be, the more you will be able to figure out what it is you want, what it is you don't want. And rather than dithering about these things and spending time trying to decide what you are supposed to be doing, you gain control over what you were meant to be doing. I think that's important because I think when we're younger, we're very tied up with what we're supposed to be doing and measuring ourselves against other people. And I have to say, my experience is that's totally pointless. Oh, Andrew, that is so true. And I wish I could go back and tell my young self, will you quit worrying about these silly things like my skin broke out in high school and was it going to break out before the big dance? And I was all, have always been tall and, you know, five nine. And, you know, I thought, well, that limits the boys who are going to go out with me. I mean, just things that were so important then. And I think young people to young people on social media looks and all of that are so important. And they just fade away in importance as we age. And I'll tell you something else. I think I've gotten better looking as I've aged, but, you know, I don't know if that's true, but I just accept myself more. Or maybe my idea of what is attractive has broadened. But, you know, people worry about their careers. Don't worry about your career. You can change your career. Just follow your heart. Don't Get hung up on how far up the corporate ladder you are at any particular age or how much money you're making. Those things become inconsequential, believe me, as you get older. They really do. And there's always time to launch another career. I mean, you've just launched yourself off as an author, haven't you? In my 60s, (laughs) I've started podcasting. I mean, you know, it's never too late for a new adventure, really, is it? It isn't. And Andrew, you're very good at it. I have to (laughs) <laughs> I've listened to several of them. You really are quite good at it. Yeah, we never know what we're going to do. And as Joseph Campbell used to say, find our bliss. But I mean, in part, that's what the journey of aging is about, is to let go of things that we thought were important to us, to zero in on what really makes us happy and allows us to live in the moment and go with that. I mean, go with your heart. I really love doing X. Well, then do X. You know, it's not a, ultimately when I look back, the one job that I had where I made the most money was the job I was most unhappy in. The jobs that you know, paid me well enough, but that I really loved were, you know, not where I was just making a lot of money and and becoming famous. It was, they were things that I could immerse myself in and look forward to every day. Now, one of the things you recommend in your book is doing a life review. Now, this idea Mm -hmm. is from Dr. Robert Butler, who thinks that looking back could be therapeutic. So how do you do it? And what did you find yourself when you did it? Well, yes. What Robert Butler described was something that he said was kind of innate to the human experience, that across cultures, people tend to reflect more as they age and kind of do their own life review. So I decided that, you know, ultimately, I think that process happens as we get older, we begin to look back, we may regret some things. It helps us decide, I guess, who we really are in part and then move on. But what I did, I sort of went back and 
not unlike a therapist, I know you'll appreciate this, might do, but to ask questions like, you know, how did you feel about being young? What were your parents like? What was your family like? How did you feel when you were part of that? What did you most dislike about childhood? What were you most afraid of? What did you like best about growing up? And going through the various stages of life and answering those questions. In fact, in my book, I have like questions at the end of every chapter. And one of them is about this life review. I just think it's really helpful to look back. And I think it's natural to look back. I'm not saying live your life in the past, but I think coming to terms with what your life has been and maybe what you'd like to do differently now, it's never too late to try something new. It's never too late to say, you know, I've never been happy doing this or being friends with this group of people, I don't have anything in common with them anymore. So then, okay, go off and make some new friends or do something different. I mean, we have a finite amount of time here. I think quite a good way of looking at this is sort of looking at what I would call 10 fierce moments. These are sort of moments where either you were something really important happened, there was a big change in something, but you know, you sort of had a kind of moment and sort of put those down and see why they were so important in your life. You're not just thinking of chronologically. I mean, you might put them chronologically, but those times that were really strong moments for you. And maybe even, have you ever heard of this, doing an unlived life review? Mm, No, but I love it already. What is it? So there are times when we decide to do A rather than B. And just for a moment, you imagine what would have happened if you've done B. This is not to wallow in regrets, but just think, you know, how would my life have been different if I had married A rather than B, or if I hadn't divorced C, or whatever it was, and actually just think for a little bit and imagine your life there. Now, this isn't done in a negative kind of way, in the sense if you actually find yourself thinking, well, here's one of my regrets from when I did my unlived life review, I would quite like to have been a painter. And I'd also quite like to collect art, which I've got one or two paintings. But when you actually do that, you then actually have got some sort of some ideas of things you could actually do now. I mean, it's not too late for me to collect art. And of course, it's far too late for me to be a professional painter, but I don't want to do that. But I could do a painting course. And you can find these things out by looking at those regrets, not in a negative kind of way, but actually seeing the life that you didn't lead. Is there any of that that you would like to incorporate into the life you have today? What do you think of that idea? I love that idea. You know, I have to say, as I went along, personally, I was pretty good at kind of following my heart, right? doing the things that I really wanted to do. And I'm not sure how I (laughs) was able to do that. What didn't you do then? (laughs) I'll tell you what I didn't do. I never finished college. Ah. You know, on some level, I don't regret not having the degree. Believe it or not, it hasn't made a difference in my life or in my various careers. But there are things I think that I wish I knew that I don't know. My husband, who is a physician and is incredibly well educated, I mean, obviously about medicine, but other things too. And he, he'll make certain references. Usually I know what he's talking about, but Sometimes I have to ask him and I always say, well, I didn't finish college, so I I don't know. So what would you like to know that you don't know, for example? (laughs) Oh, I'd like to know more about philosophy, which is sort of interesting because this book that I've written is philosophic. I mean, I studied philosophy and philosophers on my own, but some of it's really deep. And I guess I'd like to have (laughs) Would explain some of this stuff to me, like a professor who knows what he or she is talking about. Now we've identified it. I'm sure somebody <laughs> somewhere is doing a philosophy course for dummies sort of kind of thing. Oh, 
oh, I have to sign up then. I mean, there, <laughs> yes, and certain things, I mean, even literature, I, I read so much on my own. You know, after I left school, I, I ended up sort of educating myself. <laughs> but <laughs> when you do that, you don't have anybody to bounce those ideas off of, and you don't have an expert to say, but do you see the correlation between, you know, these two authors? So. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I missed. So on the subject of philosophy, you mm -hmm. ask the most wonderful philosophical question in your book, and I'd like to explore it with you, which is, why do we grow old? Ah. Yeah, I think there is a purpose. I mean, obviously, we grow old because most living things on the planet grow old. <laughs> Some trees live to be thousands of years but they still age. So, I mean, I think that's appropriate of anything that is made up of carbon and hydrogen and oxygen and, you know, all the elements that go into living beings or into our cells. But I also think for human beings, because we are the only living beings that we know of who are really able to look at who we are, reflect on who we are, and understand that there's an end to all of this. I think that the purpose then of aging is to kind of sum all of this up. And it must have some benefit because in most creatures, when they're no longer reproductive, they tend to disappear. But we have this long period where we're around and, you know, we're not going to be having more children. So there is some benefit of older people. I love this quote that you have from Isabel Allende. So could you expand on it for me? As we live, we learn who we are and with self-knowledge comes self-belief. Yeah, I think again, that's becoming aware of who we really are. And the more we know about ourselves, the more we know not only who we are, but what things are true. And I think the longer we live and can see these patterns and interact with all the people that we do and learn as much as we can, the more we can figure out what life is about. And it's hard. I think it's very hard to do when you're young. Yes, there are prescient people who are brilliant and, you know, young professors of philosophy who can kind of figure some of this out. But you really have to experience it, Andrew. You really have to go through it yourself. You have to see it. You have to live through the years to understand that. And your belief in yourself and what you see and what you know to be true only becomes, I think, stronger. I think it only grows. I have so much more confidence in what I believe in now and what I think is true. You know, I think you equivocate a lot when you're younger, in part because you are a little more influenced by other people. Not that I'm not influenced now, but in a different way, I learn from people now. And then I take in that, what I learn from them, and I say, well, you know, how can I apply this to me? A lot of times I find great comfort in how other people see the world. And it just, it enriches me and it makes me feel better about how I feel about the world. Do you know James Hillman, the archetypal psychologist, who unfortunately is no longer alive, but he has some, I think, very interesting ideas about age. He says that we age for the sake of character. And that's essential to become a mentor, a guardian, and an ancestor. That getting older is not just aging, but growing oldness in us, and that oldness has a huge value. That somehow, unless we age, we don't learn, and therefore we can't become elders, and our society rather needs elders. What do you oh. think of that? Yes, I love that. I think our society definitely needs elders. It's interesting when you were talking about, you know, his philosophy, and it reminds me a little bit of David Brooks, who is a columnist for the New York Times here I know in the him, U.S., yeah. and he tends to be somewhat conservative, although not really. I mean, he really can see the big picture in a lot of ways and see both sides of an issue. You know, he talks about 
as you age, it's not so much about checking off lists on a bucket list, like go, I want to go to Thailand or, you know, I want to skydive. I mean, I mean, these things are fine, but I mean, what David Brooks is really talking about is a bucket list, uh, what he calls a moral bucket list, you know, talk about building character. Maybe it's going back to somebody, and I, I mentioned this in my book, you know, repairing a relationship with someone. When we're older, we're, and so, and a lot of times we say, I don't know why we grew apart. I don't know why my friend is no longer a friend. Maybe I need to explore that and find out. I mean, that is part of building character. Building character is also about admitting you're wrong. You know, I was wrong about that. I saw that in a way that was kind of selfish. And I'm sorry I did that, but maybe I can make up for it in other ways. So yes, I think the idea of building character is so important. And in our culture, I hate to say it, I think there's a kind of a dearth of <laughs> people who see the importance in it. I mean, I feel that way over here, but... <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not alone. <laughs> I think that there's a very interesting idea that if a society is in trouble, it's in trouble because the elders are in trouble. And mm. I think in our society, because we're so fixated on youth and we don't ask the important questions like, who am I? The question I'll be asking, what makes my life meaningful? What are my values rather than everybody else's values? If we don't ask those sort of kind of questions and we don't learn and we don't grow oldness and character as we've been talking about, then we've got nothing to offer the, the generations underneath us. And they're going to be lost if they haven't actually got the benefit of somebody going ahead of them. Oh, I absolutely agree with that. No, really, we don't treat older people well. Again, more in the Western culture, but. You know, it's interesting, and, and I reference this too in my book about China had passed a law several years ago that said that younger people not only had to support their parents if they needed it financially, but they had to visit them. <laughs> they had to, you know, they had to go and see them so many times. I, I don't even know what the criteria are, but, you know, so many times a month or in a year or whatever. And why did they do that? Well, I think in part the Chinese, in some respects, didn't want to lose that tradition of elders being important. But maybe they also felt that it would reinforce the culture a little bit to spend more time with older people. And again, our culture, well, particularly here in the U.S., and I know it's true of other, you know, Western societies, we are so into productivity. What have you done? What are you doing? Rather than what are you thinking? What's important to you? So older people give us that other side. And also, why are we judging older people by what they do? I mean, Obviously, if you're 85 years old, you're probably not going to work every day. And here we laud older people for, oh, he's still working. Why? Why? <laughs> My question is, why are you still working? To prove you're viable? You are viable because you're 85. You are viable because you've seen history. You've been a part of history Give us some of your wisdom and knowledge and don't get hung up on trying to be 50. You're not 50, you're 85. And so you are valuable to me. You are valuable to our culture because you hold some of these secrets to what it is to be human. And isn't that really ultimately what we all are striving to do, to learn what it is to be human? And here's a lovely question you ask people to think about. What do you want to be when you get old? <laughs> well, yeah, you know, it's interesting, Andrew, because, you know, the question we ask little kids when they're little, what do you want to be when you grow up? I mean, we don't say, what do you want to do? We don't say, do you want to go out there and work nine to five in an office so you can make a lot of money? We say, what do you want to be? Which opens up a world of, like in your case, a painter, Andrew. You can be a painter. 
When you were a little kid, if someone asked you, you might have said, I want to be a painter. So let's ask older people what they want to be. They don't have to do anymore. That is the province of younger folks and middle-aged folks. There is an advantage to aging. There is a privilege that comes with being older, and that is to let go of the things we need to do and ultimately become whom we were meant to be. So I think it's a great question to ask anybody, but right. particularly older people. Let's yeah. turn that question to you. What do you want to be when you grow old? Uh, I want to be someone who finds peace in my life. I want to feel good about where I am and where I am going. <laughs> and we all know where that is. <laughs> because the older you get, the more you see the... Uh, <laughs> the limits of life itself. I'm trying to come to terms with that right now. You'd be surprised. I asked my father, if he, who is 91 now, wow. if he was frightened of death. And he said, mm -hmm. I've never really thought about it. <gasps> and he asked me, was I frightened about death? And I said, oh, no, he didn't actually ask if I was frightened of death. He said, do I think about death? And I said, well, maybe every day, not perhaps not every day, but on a regular basis. And he looks at me as if I'd come from a different planet, which <laughs> possibly I do. Oh, you know, I think part of that is being very old. I right. think when you get to his age, you become very sanguine about what is ahead of you. I think that's built in to aging. And I think it's a wonderful thing. I, I feel good for your dad and what a wonderful way to view life at that point, I guess. But I mean, when I say I'm coming to grips with that, I don't know that I'm really afraid of it. I just want to have a better sense of what is to come, I guess, uh, physically. And Are you talking about a spiritual quest then? Yes. I think that is a very important part of aging. I think it is only when we're older that we're able to begin to ask ourselves, how do we feel about this place we live? Do we think that there's only one life? Do we think there are more lives to come? Do we believe in heaven or hell, if you will? I think that it's very important to come to terms with your own spirituality. And, and I've been on a spiritual journey myself. I started out as a, an Episcopalian. I was raised that way. And then I sort of fell away and was kind of an agnostic for a long time. And then I decided I missed the mostly uh, the music <laughs> and the ritual of the church. I like that. I've always liked sitting in church with the pretty stained glass windows and it's quiet. And then you hear Bach on the organ, and I'm thinking, well, that's not all bad. But then coming back into believing, I think I have to look at my beliefs a little differently now. But I've incorporated other traditions, too, in my own spiritual beliefs. But I think uh, coming to terms with spirituality is important. And I think it does give you comfort as you get older and knowing what is inevitable for all of us. And the other great advantage of oldness is you don't have to do things anymore. So uh, what do you no longer do? Oh, there are just things that I won't do. And, you know, and I think it's okay. And I use being older as an excuse. For instance, I don't like driving at night because I don't think I see as well. My, my vision's good, but there's something about the lights and the dark and the contrast so I just say, you know, I don't like to drive at night unless I'm going to take an Uber or something. I can bow out of things I don't want to do. You know, I just say, well, I'm 73 and a half. And so I'm an older person now and, and I may not want to do that. And I, I'm also much more honest about, eh, I don't think I really enjoy that. Well, another thing is, oh, this is such a pet peeve of mine. When people invite you to dinner and then they ask you to bring something, I mean, I, maybe I'm old fashioned, but when I was growing up, my parents had a dinner party. Nobody brought anything. They didn't bring 
wine, booze. Okay, they brought cigarettes because everybody <laughs> smoked. Like, they brought their own cigarettes. Ick. But, you know, that's then. But they got dressed up and they came over and they held their little cocktails in their hands. And my mother was in the kitchen fixing a dinner. And how lovely to be invited over to someone's house and not do a thing. So I never volunteered to bring anything. And, you know, I don't want to schlep casseroles at this point in my life across town on my lap. And then they want you to take the leftovers back home. No, you fix the dinner or you go to the grocery and get a dinner that's already prepared. I don't even care if it's frozen and you bring it out. Just don't ask me to bring anything. So. And oh I feel fine saying that. I'm perfectly happy to have people bring things around. <laughs> oh, you are. <laughs> yes. Oh. I, I have to admit, I'm not so keen on taking things, but uh, particularly desserts. I love desserts, but I'm terrible at making them. So uh, I'm terrible at making them too. That's yeah. not my strength by any means. <laughs> So in a moment, we're going to look at a letter that's been sent in to us. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. So one of the advantages of becoming a supporter of The Meaningful Life is you can get all sorts of extra bonus material. You find out what my guests deep down know to be true and other bonus material, and you get the chance to write in to us. And here's a letter we've been sent. I've been in a long-term relationship which has broken down into a nasty mess. It is not worth going into the details, but it is enough to say I have been badly bruised. After licking my wounds, I have slowly began to realise that I want to get back out there again. I don't want to spend the rest of my life alone, and why should I? However, my confidence has been badly knocked. A voice inside runs me down. Nobody will want you. You need to lose weight. You're being ridiculous. Don't make a fool of yourself. No fool like an old fool. I feel there's a double standard. Men are considered to get more handsome, but women are marginalised as they get older. My ex has a new woman already. I know that I have a lot to offer, despite being in my fifties, but in the early hours of the morning, or when I think about dating, I go into a blue funk. So, what did you think when you read this, Kathleen? I feel bad for her. I feel bad because most of this is how society views women who are in their 50s and beyond. First of all, she's not really old, old. <laughs> I have a son who's 52. and Oh, my to- God. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was 21 when he was born. So, <laughs> do, do you have great-grandchildren uh, as well, then? No. I don't because he is still dating around, although I think he has found a woman that he's pretty interested in. And to tell this woman who wrote the letter, the thing my son likes about this woman that he's now dating and interested in is her intelligence. He doesn't say anything about when he was younger, oh, she's hot. Oh, she's this. So this woman needs to find men and they're out there. My son is one of them who are interested in women for who they are, for their intelligence, their sense of humor, their compassion, their experience, their maturity. There are plenty of men who, you know, I would say she should be heartened by the fact that there are plenty of men out there who are looking for someone who has that wonderful character. And I also think she's probably being hard on herself. She needs to lose weight. Look, every, probably every woman in the civilized world thinks that she needs to lose weight. My guess is she doesn't. It's such a boring topic as well, really, isn't it? Yes. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, we have different kinds of, there are endomorphs and ectomorphs and your, your body type. And I think she just needs to take a good look at herself and say, you know, I got a lot going here. And I'm going to be darn picky about the next guy who comes into my life and maybe not make the mistake of getting the guy who was going after the other woman. I mean, it happens, certainly. But my guess is this man, maybe this one she broke up with, maybe himself was afraid of aging. And when he looks at her, he sees, well, my wife is aging, I'm aging. And maybe his fear drove him. And maybe there were other reasons too, but out of that relationship, I think that often happens, particularly with men. And again, that's the society. Women are supposed to look good for their whole lives. Well, okay, men, you look good for your whole life and see how you like it. (laughs) Just because we have a negative culture about being older, and in particular for women, doesn't mean that we have to internalize it. And I think it's really important when we catch ourselves internalizing some of this stuff to sort of somehow say stop to our brains. That little voice that says nobody will want you. I mean, I almost want to say to this little voice, thank you for your opinion, but I don't agree with you. You know, because if you try and knock it down, that's actually an awful lot of work. But thank you for your opinion, but actually we're not interested or at least I'm not interested. I think that's quite a good way of dealing with these negative voices. I love that idea. I think that is so true. We are so influenced by society. And a lot of what she is saying, no fool like an old fool, that's sort of a trope that's been around forever. It's like you can't teach old dogs new tricks. I mean, of course you can't. I've got an old dog and he'll do anything for food. So you can teach him anything if you want to. (laughs) Yes, you can. And to stay an old fool, there are plenty of young people who do very foolish things. (laughs) And we all remember ourselves doing foolish things. So I'm not so sure that there's no fool like an old fool even holds up at this point. I would say, you know, you're getting older, you're getting smarter, you're getting more mature. You are becoming more desirable. So there. You're becoming more yourself. And in fact, the more you are yourself, I think generally the more appealing people tend to be. Uh, That is why I feel personally better about myself now because I think I'm finally coming into who I am. Uh, For so many years, I was trying to be all these, you know, pleasing people, which women tend to do. I mean, she's probably coming into herself in a beautiful way. And I think she has to think of herself like that. (laughs) I love the way you're throwing your shoulders around there. Uh, Yes. Yes. Throw those shoulders around. There you go. It's sort of as if you're acting in sort of Dynasty or Dallas from the 1980s, yeah. all that shoulder action. Exactly. I just need the shoulder pads to go with it. So We're waiting for them to come back into fashion. So thank you very much for being my witness on The Meaningful Life. But I have to ask you, what makes your life meaningful? I think learning. Learning is this thing that I constantly strive to do every day to learn from other people, to listen to them, to learn from nature and observe it. And the more I learn from other people and from nature and from being here, the more enriched I am, uh, the better sense I have of who I am and why I'm here. And learning something or many things every day, oh my gosh, that is so meaningful to me. It's so important. I don't ever want to stop doing that. Well, as I say, unfortunately, this is the point that we have to say goodbye to Kathleen, unless you're a member of our supporters club, because if you're a member of our supporters club, you'll get a chance for the two of us to reflect on this interview and to hear the three things that she knows deep down to be true. So, Kathleen, thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. 
Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Colick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you.